Oh, there we go. All right, well, hi everyone, and uh, thanks for your attention this whole time. My name is Weston Bussler. I am a nutrition PhD candidate at NC State University, and I've been working under the advisement of Dr. Slavko Kormaninsky. And my group, uh, we call ourselves the Nutrition Implications Group. And this is because we're uh, looking at all these food crops and trying to identify how they exactly are impacting human health and measure these in biological assays uh, that model these diseases. So we have two different crops that we're uh, spending time on this summer. And uh, the first crop that we're looking into is uh, broccoli. And our broccoli research group consists of Nikita, from the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, Caitlin from uh, Catawba College, and Jessica from UNC Charlotte. Our other groups have been working on uh, oats and researching, uh, researching a lot of the health impacts of oats. Uh, this group consists of Enrique from Catawba College, Charles, NC State, Michaela, and Ashley, both from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And uh, to give you some background on our study, I wanted to reiterate some, uh, some echo a little bit of what has been said earlier in uh, prior presentations about what has driven crop breeding in the past. A primary goal for, uh, for breeders has been increasing yield. Increasing yield is incredibly important as we need uh, to produce more foods on less land and just do it very effectively. Uh, lengthening shelf life, and as we move away from this agrarian society where we eat all the food that we grow in our own backyards, uh, we need foods that can transport over long distances, and this is really important because we don't want it to be just unedible by the time we purchase it in the supermarket. And uh, also the look, taste, and texture of a plant. This is really important for driving consumer perception, and uh, you want something that's going to look and taste and uh, just be completely all right. So why is this important? Uh, once again, we've become actually very good at doing this uh, by breeding plants, by controlling for uh, regions on their genome, uh, and identifying the regions on their genome, and controlling for those dynamic traits. Uh, however, the continued selection has caused many of the phytoactive nutrients of plants to be left behind in some of these commercial varieties, uh, especially as you try to make them all look and taste the exact same. But what we want to do is uh, retain the important progress made in the agronomic traits, as well as put back a lot of the nutrient potential or maximize what's already there. So going forward, our group has been focusing on uh, some problems that are uh, afflicting the gastrointestinal health. The broccoli uh, project is studying how it may impact uh, risk factors for colorectal cancer. And a new project this summer we're working on is looking into cereal grains, specifically oats, and how they may be impacting parameters for inflammatory bowel disease and other gastrointestinal health problems. So our first case that I'm gonna go over is a lot of the work that we've done over the past three years leading up to the summer. Broccoli, I'll focus on. Uh, broccoli is, uh, or the disease also that we're focusing on is colorectal cancer, as it is the third leading cause of cancer, cancer deaths per year. Broccoli consumption has been associated with lowering the risk of this disease. And as well, many phytoactive nutrients in broccoli uh, have. Okay, should be good. Many phytoactive nutrients in broccoli uh, have been shown to contain many of these uh, nutrient active potentials. But one problem with, uh, with this is that the metabolite concentration in these plants can vary to a large degree. And this variation can be so big, we can't actually determine how much, uh, how much broccoli a person needs to eat in order to receive any of those health benefits uh, or health active potentials for it. So what we're really doing is we're giving a, like somebody who doesn't want to eat their broccoli a data-driven reason to say, you don't really know if this is fully healthy for me. And uh, what we're trying to do going forward is to control for the genetic variation within them and produce the healthiest broccoli that we possibly can, reducing a lot of that vari variability so we know exactly what we're getting when we have it. And to do this, the first thing we need to use is a genetic resource. And this is uh, something that uh, a lot of the other projects have been working with. And in our case, we're dealing with a broccoli population developed by one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Alan Brown, who, uh, collab or one of our collaborators, Dr. Alan Brown, and uh, this is based off of two distinct broccoli parents uh, for their metabolite concentration. 
and they were inbred to breed 125 offsprings with slightly varying genetics. Then SNP markers characterize the genome of all of these plants, and then uh, we, can, or we can map them, and they produced a map through, uh, they produced a map for this, and then we can associate various phenotypes to it. The phenotype of interest that we're doing is, uh, we're working with is anti-cancer activity. And to get this, we test each of those broccoli extracts, or each of those broccoli compounds, so each of those broccoli uh, uh, progeny, we extract them and we test their ability to reduce the growth of HC29 human colon cancer cells. Then what we do is we determine how well they grow through what's called an SRB assay. What we see when we look at the two broccoli parents is that they are very different in their ability to cause apoptosis or programmed cell death. And this is one of the primary things you look for is uh, saying whether or not it's reducing the cancer activity. Because if it were necrotic, that could be basically any kind of cell death associated with it. You can throw a lot of things onto cells that will kill them. But you want to be making sure that it is the right kind of cell death you're causing. When we look across the whole population, we see a wide range of activity, from some that are only killing 15% of cells or reducing growth 15%, to some that are doing it up to 60%. And this allows us to then map these traits onto the genome and find markers that match up to the uh, ratios of change in this uh, anti-cancer phenotype. When we mapped this, we found two locations on the BRCA genome that take place in a multiple year analysis that we then used to identify genes within this location. The genes we identified are uh, connected to these compounds called glucosinolates. And these have been mentioned before as being uh, the primary targets for the anti-cancer activity of broccoli. Uh, we have three different glucosinolates showed up here, glucoraphanin, gluconapin, and progoitrin. And what we see is our first uh, gene we identified uh, was uh, homologous for a, uh, uh, um, an enzyme that controls the core biosynthesis of glucosinolate accumulation. As well, the second one uh, showcases the key branch point for activity. See, glucoraphanin is actually the glucosinolate that uh, eludes most of the anti-cancer activity. So uh, the other thing that we looked into was whether or not this ratio of these different types of glucosinolate matters. And what we saw is within our extracts, the uh, highest percentile for activity, so the top 15th percentile, had, much, had skewed much higher towards glucoraphanin and the bottom 15th percentile skewed much lower. Now this was also very interesting because it wasn't so much as the total number of glucosinolates that it was this ratio that seemed to be the most important. And so to summarize, uh, the regions were able to be mapped onto the broccoli genome that reduced cancer cell growth. Two regions contained key steps from the glucosinolate biosynthesis pathway, and glucosinolate proportion impacts the anti-cancer potential of a broccoli line. So broccoli breeders should attempt going forward to incorporate the regions on chromosome 4 and suppress the regions on chromosome 9. This method can be applied also to any other nutritional trait, as you've seen from many of the, my colleagues' presentations before me. So this uh, going forward is something we can really, really look at as a new way to identify nutrient potential in plants. And I really wanted to thank again the P2EP and everybody that supported us throughout the four years here. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with 20 undergraduate interns throughout my time here, and I can tell you from working with all those giant populations of plants, I would have never been able to get this done in uh, as short amount of time as I have. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to my interns to let them show you what we've been able to do with this project uh, this summer. So Jessica, take a look. Thank you, Weston. This summer, I studied broccoli glucosinolate profiles and their anti-cancer activity. So glucosinolates are the natural components of broccoli. They are precursors that need to be digested by the enzyme myrosinase in order to be activated and produce anti-cancer activity. If glucosinolates do not inter interact with the enzyme myrosinase, then they will be ineffective. That's why the hydrolysis of glucoraphanin is very important. Glucoraphanin is hydrolyzed when it interacts with the enzyme myrosinase to form the isothiocyanate sulforaphane which is responsible for the anti-proliferative activity seen in broccoli. This summer, we wanted to see how the glucosinolates competed. So we wanted to see if the glucosinolates were competing for the enzyme myrosinase or if they were competing for the cell.
For example, if the glucosinolates were competing for the enzyme arosinase, one glucosinolate, let's say gluconapin, would have a higher uptake of the enzyme arosinase, which would make glucoraphanin and progrotrin less active. And if the glucosinolates were competing for the cell, theoretically, the glucosinolates would have an equal uptake of the enzyme arosinase, but the products of one glucosinolate, let's say the products of gluconapin, would have a higher uptake of the cells, leaving the products of glucoraphanin and progrotrin to be less active. So to test if the glucosinolates were competing for the enzyme or the cell, we had two different experiments. The first experiment involved that treatments of both glucosinolate mixtures, the high glucoraphanin mixture and the low glucoraphanin mixture that Wes mentioned earlier. The glucosinolates were mixed together and then treated with the enzyme arosinase and then put into the cell to see if they were competing for the enzyme. And for the second experiment, we had separate treatments of the same two glucosinolate mixtures, and the glucosinolates were treated separately with the enzyme arosinase and then put into the cells to see if they were competing for the cell uptake. And here we have some results. This is a bar graph which shows the inhibitory concentration, the inhibitory competition that it took to kill at least 50% of the cancerous cells by the separate and that glucosinolate mixtures. Um, we see that there was no difference in the separate glucosinolate mixtures. We also saw that the, that, um, the high glucoraphanin VAT mixture was two times more effective than the low glucoraphanin VAT mixture. And from this, we saw that the glucosinolates were competing for the enzyme arosinase to lower the anti-cancer activity. And now I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Nikita, who's going to tell you more about the effects of glucosinolates on bitter taste. Thank you, Jess. So while glucosinolates have very important chemopreventative properties, it's also important to understand the bitterness of these compounds. So this summer, I've been studying how glucosinolates are affecting the taste in brass skull erasia. So in order to do this, I've been using a database called BitterX to identify the bitter glucosinolates. And BitterX is basically telling me if a compound is attaching to a bitter taste receptor on your tongue. And then this helped me predict the crop's bitterness. And then I did a taste panel where I would see how super tasters, tasters, and non-tasters would actually perceive the bitterness of these crops. So this was a predicted bitterness based off my glucosinolate profile. We have kale being the most bitter, followed by cabbage, then Brussels sprouts, ending in cauliflower and broccoli. And then when I compare the predicted bitterness to the perceived bitterness from my raw taste test, we found that they were correlated at a value of 0.69, showing that Glucosinolates are a good indicator for how bitter a vegetable is going to be. So from the broccoli project, these are our conclusions. Uh, broccoli glucosinolates are competing for myrosinase during digestion. And this competition is reducing their anti-cancer activity. And then some glucosinolates are contributing to the bitter flavors in broccoli. And the glucosinolate implicated in the anti-cancer study, uh, glucoraphanin, is actually reducing bitterness in these crops. And now I'll be passing it on to Michaela, who will be talking about our new project relating oats and GI health. Thanks, Nikita. As Nikita and Wes mentioned, this is a new project for this summer. We're working with oats and gastrointestinal health. And we've been working with um, multiple gastrointestinal disorders this summer. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be able to talk to a gastrointestinal disorder patient. And she said that it is really important um, to, to her that doctors can really be able to make dietary recommendations um, on top of the drugs that they can prescribe um, and that that would be really helpful for treatment um, in everyday life. One of the major dietary uh, uh, inflammatory, uh, sorry, one of the major um, diseases we've been working with is inflammatory bowel disease. IBD is, consists of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, which affects 1.4 million Americans. The symptoms typically include consistent chronic inflammation, GI tract damage, and high circulating levels of angiotensin II. There are four important steps of wound healing to the GI tract damage. Um, cells need to proliferate and migrate inwards to cover the wound because there needs to be a new layer of cells over the damaged area. Cells need to differentiate um, to take on their function in the digestive system. 
and the tight junctions between the cells need to be reformed um, to maintain the integrity of the colon. We are investigating whether there are bioactive components in oats that could help with the healing process. Now, Enrique is going to tell you about how we isolated these bioactive components and about our first health impact project. Thank you, Michaela. So in order to test our different cereal grains, which included oat, wheat, sorghum, corn, millet, rye, and barley, we need to break them down. And this process is called fractionation. And these fractions include a protein fraction, a phenolic fraction, an insoluble fraction, and a fatty acid fraction. And here's what those products look like. Another thing we did was we, we simulated in vitro protein digestion. This was done using the digestive proteolytic enzymes, pepsin and trypsin. Pepsin is found in your stomach, while trypsin is found in your small intestine. The first health impact we, we looked at was angiotensin converting enzyme inhibition, or ACE for short. And um, this graphic depicts how angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme. And um, decreasing this conversion shows the ability to alleviate uh, the severity of the experimental IBD in animals. As Michaela had mentioned earlier, they showed high levels of angiotensin 2. So the results we got was that digested oats, digested oat protein fractions are shown to be good ACE inhibitors. So this could be good for creating a natural source of ACE inhibitors. And uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to Michaela to tell you more about other health impacts we studied. Thanks, Enrique. So another project we did um, was with cell migration. And um, we used an assay that allowed us to create an exclusion zone with no cells. And then we removed the stoppers and allowed cells to migrate inwards. When we treated with different cereal grains, we saw that oats had the highest level of migration of all the cereal grains at their highest concentrations. And we also did um, another project with tight junctions. Um, and uh, to study these tight junctions, we used a stain, an antibody stain, um, that stained a protein in the tight junction called zonial oclidins 1. And we measured the fluorescence from this stain with a spectrophotometer to quantify the presence of tight junctions. With these tight junction studies, we saw that um, oats had the highest level of tight junction promotion among all the grains. Um, some of the others tended to disrupt a little bit or not affect the tight junctions, but oats seemed to perform the best. So in conclusion, um, the oats the digested oats seem to have the best effect with the um, inhibiting ACE conversion. And oat peptides performed the best with the migration studies among all the grains. And oats also seem to help promote tight junctions um, better than the other cereal grains. Come visit our posters, please, if you have any questions. We'll go more in depth. 